Um, some of these issues we can develop uh, with our, our, our next uh, panel, which is um, an interesting event for me because it kind of uh, cements uh, what they've accomplished and, and where they are uh, in, in, in industry. Um, we have with us uh, representatives from Microsoft, from IBM, and from Red Hat uh, talking about their um, their uh, latest business move that turns out not to be such a new thing, but it's a thing they've been working on uh, for quite a while. Uh, we have uh, Sri Vatan, who's a 13-year veteran of, of Microsoft, and he's now the Chief Technology Officer of Microsoft's U.S. Azure Business Group. Um, John Gravison is IBM's Chief Technology Officer for the state of California, where he covers IBM's engagement uh, with state's agencies, departments, counties, and higher education. Um, Kyle Sobolski uh, focuses on Red Hat's public sector market from a technology and policy perspective and is actively engaged in leading the company's next generation data center practices enabling uh, enterprise grade open solutions. Uh, Kyle also has some uh, experience working for IBM, so he's seen this from both sides and uh, uh, you we know, can hear a little bit about uh, how that has been for you. So gentlemen, please, uh, please join us. So IBM and, and uh, Microsoft, in, in, in my youth, which isn't that long ago, were seen as uh, very energetically proprietary that uh, you had code sets that were uh, highly defended and were um, it, it, it were just not that shareable. That was kind of the point. They made a lot of money that way. Um, and now, uh, this past year, we've got Microsoft uh, purchasing GitHub, and we have IBM uh, about to close the deal with um, Red Hat. Uh, it's not as though this is a new venture. Um, both of your companies have been involved in, in open source code and open platforms. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what led up to these transactions and, and where you think uh, customers might see see the results first or in, in changes? And we'll ask uh, Kyle to give his perspective on the Red Hat, the red hat uh, point of view. So, start with you, if you could, Sri. Hi all. Uh, my name is Srikant Macha. Uh, I've been with Microsoft for about 13 years. Uh, started my journey uh, in uh, customer support for Active Directory, uh, leading teams there to then uh, lead application, application uh, engineering, uh, managing our sales and finance applications, leading teams there, uh, developer teams as well as uh, IT, and uh, Nokia, leading Nokia's IT infrastructure, uh, lead there about close to six uh, data centers, running those. And uh, around three years ago, uh, I took a turn and moved into uh, marketing from IT uh, because Microsoft gave me the ability to do that. And they, they said all the experience that I gained there, I can actually put into the company. And, and through this journey, and where I actually started um, working for a startup much before Microsoft as an Apache admin. And uh, working on uh, you know, developing small little API. From there to being in Microsoft, where Microsoft always had an association with open source, but not not in a big way at that time. Um, you know, NT Windows NT uh, used to have um, uh, you know, code that was shared in POSIX. Basically, POSIX was was portable operating system standards that uh, that was out there. But not in a very big way to, to the point that our ex CEO, uh, and I'll be like super transparent here, uh, went on to CNBC to say Linux is cancer. And, and that kind of uh, you know, set out a blaze, and we were like completely shut down. Like developers used to hate us, uh, especially the ones who uh, develop on open source. Those are the times where our commercials were heavily centered around Windows Server. How we would uh, you know, vehemently um, compete with 
red hat, and red hat was really growing. So that was that time. And, and as it happens now, Azure actually uses some Linux red hat uh, workloads. Yeah. So basically, from there, where we were super complete to 2014, when Satya Nadella uh, took over, uh, and and already there was a, a lot of uh, like work happening in the company to basically embrace the community and not have this isolationist kind of a strategy. Where uh, basically, first thing that uh, Satya did was went on to stage and build uh, our big developer conference to say Microsoft loves uh, Linux, uh, right? And Microsoft loves open source. You know, that's what I'm saying. Very not here. But uh, you know, the CEO saying that and a random guy wearing a T-shirt. Uh, doesn't change the whole perception. So basically, we started off in this journey. Um, the .NET Foundation was formed in 2014, uh, and a VS Code uh, was was introduced. Basically, Visual Studio, uh, VS Code, open source completely, and we basically uh, got that out, put it out there, and started developing on it. That was 2015. Um, Stack Overflow rated us to be seven percent. Uh, utilized by the developers using about 70,000 developers and number 13. And last year, 2018, uh, uh, the beginning of this year, 34% of developers are using Visual uh, VS Code uh, and the number one dev tool uh, out there for developers. So we've come a long way, and in between that, there are many, many stories, right? Uh, from HD Insight, one of our big data uh, platform. Uh, initially being announced on uh, on Ubuntu and uh, Windows, and very silently last year we retired a Windows Server support for HD Insight. There's a whole culture. I think the meta point is the culture of open with open source is something that Satya is driving. Uh, and, and now every developer we bring in, we ask that they have open source uh, background or even give them training uh, for open source. So. That at a culture level, all the way down to opening up code internally. I mean, I came from IT where the developer would not share code with even the ops team, right? I mean, now DevOps like brings all of us so close, but then that was not open. On days where my deployment team would be ready to deploy into production, the developer would it, uh, would not be there sometimes. To the, sometimes we would say. Okay, you know, I'm not going to open up uh, the code. If you re uh, realize there's a bug, let me know. I'll be on call and I'll solve it. Right from there to now, every employee FTE has access to uh, product uh, Git as well as uh, Visual Studio across. I mean, DevOps uh, really DevOps as a product, which is uh, what we rebranded Visual Studio, uh, opens it up for every employee. We can see code as well as come and look at best practices. Uh, and, and I think Dave mentioned this, uh, but uh, you know, basically, Git, uh, GitHub, even before the acquisition, starting in 2014, we, we contributed about 70,000 from repos to Gits to, to basically best practices and scripts all uh, available there. To last year, 700,000 articles were posted by employees of Microsoft uh, to being the biggest uh, contributor by any enterprise company. Right. So it actually blended very natural for us uh, with more than uh, 5,000 developers who develop on open source, uh, with 16,000 developers uh, all over the community actually posting on GitHub. A lot there basically to say that uh, the new Microsoft is not a closed uh, Microsoft, uh, and we've come uh, a long way partnering with Red Hat to right now have for every Windows Server VM in Azure, they actually Linux VMs, right? And, and we operate uh, from Red Hat to Ubuntu, CentOS, all of these platforms. So, long cultural journey, and I'm very, very happy to have you. So, one of the things uh, the press reported is that Microsoft is trying to buy developer loans with, uh, with the purchase of GitHub, and that you're not only making work easier for developers on the outside, you're making work easier for your own developers. Is it, you know, do you see this kind of a similar thing happening with, with the purchase of um, Red Hat, or does it all mix together where you're going to benefit from a, a GitHub purchase as well as um, the Red Hat? Well, first of all, I don't think Microsoft has to buy any developer loan. It's certainly one of the most popular development 
framework software that yeah. you create, incredibly popular with IBM as well. Um, I think, just to go back to the first part of your question, for IBM, this really started changing in the 90s. Um, when, when, when we start seeing a very large, deliberate growth in our services businesses, uh, and it, it sort of became apparent to IBM that we needed to be really active in and drive a lot of innovation that came out of the open standards organization in the 1990s, right? Those old standards organizations were then gradually supplanted by something even more dynamic, which was open source consortia, right? And, and to us, this sort of big mental shift started probably around 1999, right? When IBM invested roughly a billion dollars in, in Linux in trying to make Linux into a viable open alternative to, uh, to Windows, in fact, right? Because everybody was running on Windows, right? The whole market was gravitating to win Windows at that point in time. And today, strangely enough, if we look at it, um, Linux is the preferred operating system on IBM's mainframes. We have probably 10 times more Linux installations on our mainframe uh, platform today than we have the original CLS installs running there. Then up through the, uh, the 2000s, it, it became sort of evident that unless you were involved in, unless you were leading and taking part in open source innovation and, and really beginning to harvest the innovation coming out of those communities, it would be incredibly difficult for you to continue to compete effectively in the industry. Uh, so today we have about 62,000 software engineers that are participating in various open source communities around the world. It's, it's probably ingrained in the majority of IBM's products today. If we take a look at probably one of our most well-known products, the Web3 application server, that, that server itself is based on over 100 open source projects, uh, just pre-integrated, et cetera, et cetera. We couldn't have done that without being part of all these communities. And so th this is absolutely foundational to our IBM operations business today, and we also see it's incredibly beneficial to our services business to be at the forefront of the development inside open source. How, how is it going to uh, affect your business in the public sector? Well, I, I think it's going to, so, so first of all, I'm very happy to see California having taken this shift and being in this sort of movement towards uh, open source. And I, I think what will happen is, is uh, that we see open source gradually maturing more and more, right? It's, it's IBM, Microsoft, Red Hat for that matter, right? None of us in the business are fail fast and break everything, right? This, this is all about thoughtful innovation, but it's all about harvesting the innovation that comes out of the open source communities, and on that basis, building enterprise ready software products. So you can be certain that, that whatever comes out of these new companies in this particular space is open source technology that is driving some of the largest and most mission critical systems anywhere in the world today. This, this is secure, it's safe, it's scalable, it's portable, it, it's all those things, right? So for the open sector, sorry, for the government sector, I think this means access to a lot more choice, a lot more portability, a lot more openness, but also the sort of assurance that there is a lot of a lot of momentum, if you will, and a lot of industry strength capacity put into the development of open source software. Okay, Kyle, uh, we're using some of uh, your tools in uh, our uh, innovation lab, and could you give us a feel for how uh, how Red Hat might influence both Microsoft further and, and IBM, given, given your role in the cloud? I mean. I forgot to say at the very beginning, these are these are both open source uh, moves, these business decisions, but it has a lot to do with the future of the cloud. Is that correct? Yeah, I think, I mean, first, right, I think one of the things that open hits on is, is this, for lack of a better word, ostensible right, architecture. And for 25 years, Red Hat's been doing nothing but open, right? We don't sell software, we never have. We sell a subscription, and what we sell is support. So for us, this is what we've always done, um, and and that's kind of what we geek out on. I mean, you know, we, we've got this meritocracy-based um, 
uh, company, right? And you're free to challenge anybody at any time, which is kind of very much the, the developer's world, right? We challenge each other, and, and we do that for the good of the project, and nobody ever takes it personally, right? So I think one of the cool things about what you're going to see from a lot of these movements are that it's going to change the way that business happens at both of these companies. And you're already seeing it, right? I think we, and for any hockey fans out there, right? Seven years ago, if we were sitting next to each other, there's a good chance, like, we're dropping the gloves and we're going to go at it, right? Um, between Microsoft and, and, and Red Hat. But that's not the way it is anymore. Right? When you use a, a, a RHEL Linux distro, right, you can be assured that it's the same in Azure as it is in AWS, as it is in IBM, as it is in Google, as it is on your premise. And the world's really gonna, gonna be about hybrid. You know? And so I think from that standpoint, what you're gonna see is this open, collaborative in, environment right, really take off. Open, not easy. It's open. And, and one of the things that we do, um, we do innovation labs for organizations now. We go out, we do eight weeks, right? We go in and, and, and we teach people what open really means. And we don't sugarcoat it. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it here. Open isn't easy. But it is really, really cool. And it allows you to do things that you could never have done otherwise in a much faster way with a higher level of security, right? Community-based security is the best thing for the market. So all of that starts to change, right? I think from the very beginning. And it, it's going to make a whole bunch of companies a whole lot better at what they do. John, can you talk a little bit about this evolution and, and uh I know five years ago you hired a bunch of designers, thousands, and, and bringing in new ideas. How does that help with IBM kind of redefine its brand or reinvent its brand, particularly just now with this new link up that we've got in the three of us? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, and we're still in the process of hiring thousands of designers. And, and when we talk about designers, we talk about real designers, people that are coming from design schools that don't necessarily know much about technology or IT for that matter, uh, because what we find is that they look at the world in a very, very different way than the rest of us, us technologists do, right? They look at it more holistically. They come in with an appreciation from uh, the social sciences, things like ethnography, things like good design practices, anthropology, etc. And, and we're beginning to see how that not only influences the way we design our products, this is not just a thin design layer on top of the user interface. This is something that profoundly influences how we look at our products end to end, how we look at the IBM brand, how we look at the IBM culture, how we make decisions, how we go through decision-making processes inside IBM that are influenced by real deep design thinking. So this to us is more of a cultural transition that, that we are going through. We are learning a lot from these from having been a, from a real traditional technology company to being a company that infuses design and technology, right, with the social sciences. Um, and so we, we definitely see the, the Red Hat acquisition and, and the sort of cultural injection from a company that, as Carl said, thoroughly grew up and was incubated into this entirely different way of working and thinking, right, or something that we hope will be an accelerator of IBM's culture and just accelerate that culture forward. We've been trying to do that for a while, but it is a company with 450,000 people, so it takes a while. And it's a company that's all over the world, so it takes a while, right? And being in government, you should know how long these cultural transitions <laughs> take. So this, this is like... 230,000. Yeah. Sorry, but yeah this is like an Not injection, right, yeah. an injection in the arm, right? To, to really sort of reinvigorate the culture in addition to what we have been doing ourselves. Yeah, I'd like to add that uh, at, at Microsoft, uh, one of, again, going back to the change culture, right, which is so ingrained, uh, moving away from our old uh, mission to the new mission that we, we set up on, which is basically to make 
every individual and uh, enterprise uh, more subject to achieve more, right? Which, which basically is putting customer at the root of it. And why why the whole change is because customers want more charge. And, and we'd like to go be there, offer solutions, and let the customer basically look at, uh, you know, adopting solutions that will make them win. And if I take and turn it around, Forrester said uh, that 40% of CIOs have open source as their primary strategy. Uh, and, and if we look at uh, public sector, that's less than 10%. So I'm extremely, uh, you know, excited that these folks are, are taking a, uh, you know, a spearheading role here by, by saying, okay, open source will not only be ingrained, but also something which will, uh, which will run the state, right? And that sets a great precedence for the rest of the country. So uh, with that said, why are CIOs saying that is because developers are pushing for this innovation. About 90% uh, of developers would want cloud uh, providers have open source ingrained solutions that will work seamlessly with open source as well as hybrid. Again, Microsoft has a very rich set of uh, license-based software, whether it's SQL Server or Windows Server, but also working to bring SQL Server and the power of SQL Server on uh, Linux, for example, in the latest version, actually since 2016, is now uh, deployable on Linux, and that, that opens up new, I mean, it, it, it's great to have that for customers, but also for Microsoft, opens up new revenue streams so, you know, we are definitely profit motivated. We look at where customers are going and definitely are opening up uh, there, right? So that, that developer push is why you're right. We'd like to give much more love to developers. Uh, GitHub has 31 million developers you know, as their members. And Microsoft has close to 50 million uh, developers who have been there developing all the way from uh, VB and Ubiquitous and so on to now. And, and this brings both of us together. One of the questions you asked on GitHub and, and where are we going with GitHub, right? Uh, GitHub will have their own CEO and like what we did with LinkedIn and a couple of other acquisitions, they will run it as an independent uh, entity and it will not be biased towards uh, Azure or any of Microsoft technologies. But if you are uh, using GitHub, you can still continue to go to any cloud, which includes our biggest competitor, AWS great product, great personal advantage. You can actually go post there, or Google, or SoftLayer. And all of these uh, will integrate. So you are basically, you can use GitHub for any language, at any time, any cloud, and that will continue to be. That is uh, Microsoft's promise, that's Satya's promise. Matt Friedman, uh, who's the CEO currently, uh, is, is full on on something like that. So we will continue pushing on that. And Kyle was saying you will be agnostic in all yeah, I mean, right within the community, that's been a that's been a huge topic, right? Because uh, I think in in the press release, I I think it was our CEO who said we're going to be like Switzerland, <laughs> um, and you know, I think I think IBM has a has a realization, right, that um, that because we sell in essence support, give away software, um, you know. There isn't really any IP within within Red Hat. It's our people. That's what makes the difference. It's what's always made the difference. It's what Open is about. It's about the people. And so for us, in a focus, right? Um, that you know, that's really where it all comes back to, is where it all started from, right? So I think understanding that in a lot of ways. It starts and ends there. I think is what's really gonna what's really gonna carry us through, and we will be run as a as you know within IBM's hybrid cloud unit, but but as a separate entity, and we'll be left to to do that because that's what they're buying, right? Thirty four billion dollars, one third of their market cap. It's crazy, right? But that's the value of open source, right there. Let that sink in. Thirty four billion dollars, ten times. Our, our market cap, that's what IBM paid for it. That's how important open source is to the world. I would say it's, it shows the importance that open source comes right. Correct. Right? That's yes. what Red Hat has stood for in the years. Yes. 
the decades. Right. That's a good point. So, if I may sum up, the takeaways are that change for very large uh, traditional companies is possible, but you have to work at it a lot. And big okay. governments do too. Okay. Um, the future is it's open, but it's also open and hybrid. So we'll be mixing products, and I will take uh, a new knowledge base. And uh, the third, and maybe most important, is that we are going to be turning over some of much of the power of the computer to our people, and they'll become our most important factor. I'd like to uh, add that um, I think I'm not going to touch too much uh, from a strategy standpoint. Um, that how do you uh, take it forward for for Microsoft? Uh, our open source strategy uh, revolves around three pillars. I think this is where we could probably use this as an open source yeah. you know, best practice. Uh, number one is innovate, right? Innovate with uh, customers being at the center uh, and bring products, uh, whether they are first party or even uh, third party, which, which uh, didn't come at Microsoft. For example, Kubernetes. I, I'm, I'm a great lover of Kubernetes. Brendan Burns, one of the founders, is uh, now at Microsoft. Every session that he delivers, I, I try to go sit in there and learn from him, right? Because uh, the whole world is adopting uh, Kubernetes in different forms and, and ways, whether it's managing big data or uh, you know something traditional like a VM or apps on on you know serverless kind of a format, right? Uh, and and you know Lambda, for example, uh, which which is a great product from AWS. Uh, you you can take that and use Kubernetes as as a um, as an integration factor for some of your legacy. So uh, taking you know, innovation at the core as one of the key uh, pillars is, uh, you know, you take uh, your existing stuff, innovate on that, and reward reuse, right? I think that's that's a big part of it. Uh, all the way down to our uh, review mechanism, our, our performance appraisals, it's all about how have you taken someone else's work and made it better, right? And not just about, oh, this is my idea, this is what I'll go after, I'll lay a few dead bodies behind me. That's not going to be rewarded. So that that is number one in terms of innovation. Second is contribute. Everyone is, is uh, rewarded by how much you're contributing back to the community, not about keeping it to yourself. So GitHub, you know, it's, it's almost like uh, you go around the company. Developers say, oh, I have about a thousand plus articles that I have actually uh, authored, authored on GitHub, or I uh, have um, have committed or uh, or helped others, right? And, and finally, it comes down to how are you enabling that ecosystem, right? So uh, Microsoft believes in enabling through partners. So we have many of our partners, it's, whether it's uh, ISVs like yourself, Red Hat, or our SI partners, enabling them and having really good support mechanism. I think one of the things that everyone struggles with, which Red Hat has uh, really figured out well, is the support mechanism, which we are also trying to enable. If you come to Microsoft or hey you know my my Red Hat is you know uh, OS is broken or my CentOS is uh, broken. We want to provide that support and enable that. That's that's the big differentiator uh, versus uh, saying yeah it's your problem. Uh, you 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 open source you not support me right. So that's uh, that's very inherent and these three pillars kind of help us uh, take our our newfound love towards open source much much further. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Please go ahead and see you on the back of the ground. Thank you. Three. Thank you. Thanks for making the time for us. Thank you. We are ready for our lightning round. I'm Rebecca. Uh, thank you so much for inviting someone from uh, the city perspective. I work for the city of San Rafael. I've worked there for the past 10 years. And um, I'm here to talk about how in San Rafael we are learning how to make government work better by sharing what we make, learn, and improve. So I actually didn't know a guy from Red Hat was going to be here. This is cool. I think you're going to like some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. 
Um, last year, we have an employee book club, and last year we read The Open Organization by Jim Whitehurst, the CEO of uh, Red Hat. And a couple of guys from Red Hat actually Skyped into our book club. It was really cool. Uh, and this book really inspired us to start thinking about the culture and the people in our organization and how we can embrace the idea of openness as a tool to make government and as an organization work better. So he talks about in this book that really to create this open everything culture, you have to be passionate, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity, you have to thrive with change. And that's not always what we think about when we think about the typical government bureaucrat, but I think that's changing. So in San Rafael, we uh, have embarked on a culture change initiative that we call Together San Rafael. And this initiative is really to drive the modernization of our services and to also make San Rafael an awesome place to work. So connecting the people and the services together. And we've co-created these guiding principles with our employees. And my favorite is practice openness. So this is our intranet from a while ago. It was a SharePoint site that was from like 2003, I think. And um, no one ever really went there. It was a horrible place. You can, if, can't see, but some of the, the announcements there are from like years ago. So last year, we decided instead just to build a public facing mobile first website with no password for our employees. So now employees have access to information without having a password. Um, it's also an incredible recruitment tool because prospective employees can see who we are and how we work. And we also can share everything that we are doing with other cities. So on here, you'll find easy to access answers to common questions like, this is the mileage reimbursement rate for 2018. You won't update that soon. This is a guide that we created for our employees on how to conduct outreach with the community. Um, and actually on here in the menu there, there's a tab called writing about people. And that's a guide that the city of Oakland made for their employees and we credited that and borrowed it uh, and made it for San Rafael because it was so awesome. This is um, actually the page that we have the most views per month, which is how to write a staff report. And I can tell you that those views are not our employees. The staff reports would be better. So this is us contributing back to the world um, of local government on how to write better staff reports. So what's exciting to me about an open culture in government, there's 20,000 cities across the United States. 10 are more than a million, but 90% of them are under 25,000 people. These are small municipalities that don't have a lot of resources. So by practicing openness in government, we can scale innovation and solutions to cities of all sizes. Last year, 6,000 homes were burned in the Tubbs fire. Santa Rosa is my hometown. Uh, and I went to work in the emergency operations center under mutual aid. And one of the things we found right away was that people didn't have access to information on websites that worked on mobile phones. So my friend and I, my colleague and I from Santa Rafa, we came up to Santa Rosa and we stood this site up in three days for people. It's still up today providing, providing recovery information. Uh, on a mobile site, and it also bridged the county of Sonoma and Santa Rosa together to use one site rather than maintaining a multiple site. I saw this the other day. I had nothing to do with it. This site was stood up by someone from Santa Rosa coming to help Paradise in their time of need and stood this up in a matter of days for people. So here we had Santa, Re Santa Fe hit helping Santa Rosa during their time of need, and then helping Paradise, a city of 27,000 people, get critical information to their constituents on a mobile first site. This was launched in a couple of days, and this to me is openness at scale. Jim Whitehurst in his book, he said, if we have anything valuable, it's incumbent upon us to share it. And I think government should embrace this. So this site is just waiting in the wings now. This is Marin Recovers. Hopefully we never have to turn it on. But if we do, any community in Marin will have access to it.
whether it stand or fell, a city of 60,000, or Bolinus, a city of 1,600. So in closing, uh, going back, go buy this book. <laughs> um, as we make new things, as we learn and improve, let's also share them, because almost everything in the world becomes better when it's open. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shani Amanovan. I am the Director of Innovation for California Health and Human Services. Um, so I am coming back to California, back to Sacramento. I spent the last 20 years in federal service um, at the um, CFPB, which was mentioned earlier, and at U.S. Digital Service for the last year of the Obama administration. I'm from here, so my coworkers are joking that I did a reverse ladybird, so I just I left and then I came back. But it's for good reason. Um, so... I don't have any slides, so I'm just going to talk through this. So, um, <laughs> so one of the things that we've talked about with the Office of Innovation is innovation in itself is a really squishy, really fuzzy word, like what exactly does it mean? So what we decided to do is we decided to create an evolution for the office. So we're focusing on innovation being problem definition, and that's all we're focusing on for the first phase of our maturity. So the staff I have, and there's a few in the audience here today, we went through training to learn human-centered design, to learn facilitation skills, a little bit of an introduction to uh, technology, um, and also uh, some of the different design thinking techniques, all for the skill set of what I think state employees need to do, which is all this talk about open source is wonderful, it's excellent, these are great tools. But until state employees learn a different skill set, it's going to be hard to leverage these at scale and leverage them properly. So by having staff being able to go out and ask the right questions to actually really understand what problems we're solving, it'll make our ask better when we work with partners. When we bring in contractors to actually build something, it'll be a more specific ask. For example, a lot of times we come in and we say, what's the problem? And pardon me, I'm name, the nameless said, now we're going to solve all nutrition problems for all Californians. And we're like, that's great. That's really big. Can we make that a little smaller? So one of the things we do is we focus on, it's trademark, but we smallify the problems and we make them smaller and smaller so that we end up with something that is solvable in a six-week increment. So we ruthlessly use agile and lean methodologies. So everything we do is six weeks or shorter. We might do a longer one, but right now it's six weeks. For a couple reasons. One, we don't want to get stuck in a project forever and ever and ever. But also, by having these six-week engagements, we create a sense of urgency. So the partners that we're working with at the departments, you know, we're only here for six weeks, and we're building this with you shoulder to shoulder. So if you don't make folks available, you're going to have a less than optimal result out of this thing. So um, one of the things that's really cool about joining Health and Human Services, uh, when I came back, I was at CDT for a while. And then this opportunity opened up, so I, I came over here. Health and Human Services already has a head start in a lot of this um, from uh, previous efforts in open source. So about four years ago, um, Health and Human Services made a major effort to start being on the forefront of open source data and opening things up. What we found is that by opening up the data and adding collaboration from the outside, people were able to build things for the state that the state itself can never do. We don't have the time, we don't have the resources, but that provides better in services to the constituents, to the counties, to the cities, and all the other people that we work with. So we found that that was really important. So um, Mike Wilkening, Secretary Mike Wilkening, um, gets all the credit for this. He saw that not only can you take this and apply it to open source, but if you scale it up and apply it to other things, we can start seeing these economies of scale and these benefits of scale. So that's how the office got created, and then insert what I said earlier about me showing up. Um, <laughs> So um, one of the things that my staff is doing is you mentioned that we do human-centered design. Um, we do problem definition. So one of the other big things is product management, because I'm trying to drive the mentality that product drives better outcomes. Just using awesome tool sets, great. But if you're only thinking about things from a project standpoint, which is scope, time, cost, quality, a little bit you're still not keeping your eye on, are you building the right thing to solve the problem? So adding that mindset to it of product management of, hey, what's the problem that people are running into, and how are we going to solve that? 
But in order to do that, you have to have the skills I talked about earlier in human-centered design. You have to go in, you have to sit down, and a lot of times I send my staff into really hostile <laughs> environments. Sorry, but I do. Um, because people are like, what is this fuzzy innovation thing? But when they sit down and they have the empathetic listening and they're like, what's the problem you're trying to solve? What are your pain points? Then it shifts and it becomes like, oh, great. Let's talk about solving this together. And you can see that mind shift happen. So with a lot of the open source things that we're seeing that are being launched here, which is great, what I'm hoping is that this office can help and efforts like this all throughout the state can help with the front part of that, which is are we building the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? So when we use these tools, it's a beautiful synergy of the right problem, a really well thought out solution, and the right tools to support that. So I'll give you two quick examples and then I'll stop yapping. Um, so two of the projects that I'm really proud of, one is we did a project with our um, friends at Oshped, Office of Hate and Estate. Thank you, Statewide Health Planning and Development. I'm still learning all the acronyms. That's how new I am to the state. Um, one of the things that my team did is we went in, we did a workshop to help re- build or reimagine the form that researchers use to request um, data from the state for research purposes. So by sitting side by side with the researchers, we did a series of workshops, found out all the different pain points, rebuilt the form, and at the end of it, we got feedback that people are really excited to go back and see this form and use it to request data. When was the last time you saw people excited about a new government form being released? <laughs> so, like, that is a great litmus test. But because it cut through a lot of the redundancy and a lot of the questions, and it just makes it more streamlined, both for the researchers and for the employees, we're hoping that this is going to speed up the request process quite a bit by a few months. We'll see. Um, it's so new, we haven't had feed, um, actual results back, but it's one of the beauties of being new is we can talk about things and how we think it's going to work without having to show you real results yet, but we will, we will. Um, the last thing is, in a couple of different engagements, we've run into a situation where a lot of times with recruiting, people complain about the same things, but when you sit the people at the table, you have IT and they're looking across the table glaring at HR and they're glaring back and you're like, whoa, what's going on here? And it's a lot of times because they see each other as the problem, like you just throw stuff over the wall and you expect us to fix it. So the beauty of this approach, by looking at the common problems between the two audiences, is they start to see, oh, that problem, that's our same problem. Oh, and if we do this, that makes your life easier. Oh, and if we do that, then your life is easier. Then suddenly the conversation becomes less adversarial and becomes, oh, great, let's build this together. And we've seen that in three different engagements now. So what we're hoping is that these little improvements start to build and build, and pretty soon you see hiring go down from months and months and months to, one of our departments is down to 60 days. Um, can't, I'm not gonna take all the credit for that. But we've done little improvements and help them um, start to add technology to that, so you're gonna see even more increases. So human processes get better, then the technology comes in and makes that work at scale. All right, thanks for your time. Good morning, everybody. I recognize I'm the last speaker between lunch, so I know that you're probably hungry, but anyway, thanks again for having me today. I'm Chris Cruz, the Chief Deputy Director of the Department of Technology, and I'm really here to talk to you about a couple core components. I want to go back in time to when, when the Office of Innovation or Digital Innovation was born. Uh, back in the day, the Office of Digital Innovation was actually known as the Office of the Geographic Information Officer. At that time, our Geographic Information Officer was Scott Gregory. So what we did in the fall of 2015, really in collaboration with the government operations agency, is we really wanted to have an area where we could really uh, level set an evergreen in terms of looking at greenfield applications moving forward and what are the relative competencies and capabilities in which to do so. So we started in our office, and within the Department of Technology, the director at Amy Tong and I really repurposed this office from the Office of the Geographic Information to the Office of Digital Innovation in the spring of 2016. And again, what was really born about that is how are we going to enable digital-centric services to the public? How are we going to do that in a way that's secure, that's efficient, that has the necessary capabilities and competencies around that? So one of the things we wanted to do is also proliferate security. You know, we've heard about security, we've heard about policy, and how do we align the applicable policies that we've laid out today to ensure that this is moving forward in the right manner? So one of the things that we did in terms of putting this all together is we developed really a, a greenfielding and um, sandbox for folks and developers to come in and provision their own code within this innovation lab. Um, happy to announce through our Digital Services Innovation Academy in 2018, we have generated a new portion of the process that we're going to talk to you about today that I think you'll find really interesting. 
So open source is changing our approach in terms of how we do business. So in our digital services in Academy, when we, when we kicked this off back in the summer of 2018, we wanted to talk about a different and more agile way of doing business. And really in a way that's disrupted, but has a necessary rigor and change control and change management around these applicable competencies. So as you can see, the students went through a rigorous six to eight week class and they developed some pretty great applications. As you can see, at the far left, the CIPIC user testing portal, really improving the CA experience, testing our digital services, and putting it in a sandbox before you actually mirror it and put it into production. Uh, around that, the, the students developed a talent hub in terms of connecting skills with projects and how you do that. Uh, there was a CalSAFE emergency notification alert that was also developed as part of the sandbox within the innovation lab and co.ca to go. And last but not least, single sign-on for services in terms of My California. So all of these great applications were done by students within the state of California, really within an incubator for innovation and developing a test center for excellence. And moving forward, we're happy to announce that this is the next progression of step in the administration to make these uh, production systems a reality and share this applicable code not only within state government, but cities and counties as well. We think it's important that we connect California, and connecting California is providing digital services to our constituents, and this is important moving forward. So laying out the foundation within our playbook, laying out the key foundational components with what we're doing with our policies is going to be really important as we aggregate and leverage the necessary IT investments to align with business vision. Last but not least, one of the other areas that we're really making some key changes to is our innovation lab. As we talked about previously, we have the innovation lab in there to build, test, collaborate, prove open source solutions, and do it in a secure manner. We're also introducing identity access management as another supplemental phase to improving our services for security. But really an area I think that we're all really excited about is new aspects that we will act actually have is test drive and experiment solutions with vendor hosted solutions for the first time. So really what we're doing is partitioning the innovation lab to be able to move forward and make this really a two-pronged approach. Again, talking about a center for excellence and an incubator for information. We think it's really important for uh, the Red Hats of the world, obviously the IBM, the new strategic partnership, and other vendors to come in as a test proof of concept to prove their goods and see if we can leverage open source code within this particular, particular repository. All in all, we think that this will be uh, proved out to be best of breed content for IT and it really is a community to leverage. And when we talk about IT community, and I know we've talked about it from a director perspective, and Amy's mentioned this several times, we're one IT community. And that uh, community really convalesces from the state, the counties, the municipalities, and the educational institutions. We want to address ideas in an expedient manner to bring digital services to the system, as I call connecting California applicably. And so Scott Gregory, our uh, digital innovation officer, and also in, in collaboration with Government Operations Agency, will continue to move these particular efforts forward, I think, to bring these expedient services um, into the hands of our constituents to ensure that we have solutions that make sense both now and into the future. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. Well, this is really this close. I'm actually the last speaker before you are free to go. Um, and a part of the reason why we're here today is actually to do the soft launch of this effort and initiative, right? And I think you've heard from our speakers, our panelists, that this is really going to be an ongoing effort. It's going to be iteration, and it's going to be focused on really building a culture of collaboration and openness, not just in state government, but across our jurisdictions. And this is why we're here today, to do the soft launch of Code California. And so I don't want to keep you here much longer, but do want to let you know that this is going to be, or it is, a holistic approach. The Department of Technology released the policy this summer. Um, we have the playbook or a draft playbook in place that has actually been developed, and you can all see it if you go to go.code.ca.gov. I, I do want to give a shout out to Luke, who's in the audience, who actually put a lot of work and effort into this initiative, including the fancy and really nice sticker, stickers that you can all pick up on your way out. Um, in order to be able to continue to expand this, this community, we need to engage, right? So the plan is to, uh, starting in 2019, in collaboration with the tech community at the state level and other efforts, we'll be able to uh, release a series of events to be able to continue to gather your thoughts on, on what we really need to prioritize and include into this playbook, right? Because we don't have all the answers quite yet, and maybe we never will, right? 
And so uh, as part of this effort, we want to make sure that we do get your input, that you stay tuned in all of the different uh, initiatives um, and, and things that we'll be sharing through go.co.ca.gov. We have, um, we'll be able to have a governance uh, structure in place that we'll be, we'll be able to build with our, our tech leaders here at the state level. Uh, we have a platform in place, and obviously there's an emphasis on cross-collaboration across the different jurisdictions with the private sector, but also the local and, and federal level. And so this is a long way of saying this is not just for the state of California. We're really trying to build a broader ecosystem of partners and, and, and first and early adopters, people that really believe in, and not just the technology of open source, but the culture of an open organization and an open government. And so we're looking forward to iterating and evolving this effort with you all. This will affect you as the public, right? So we'll have the network. We have a Slack channel that you can all join. Uh, you all will be users uh, and members of this broader initiative that is Code California. But ultimately, our state government and the government partners will be the ones leading the charge and implementing the policy and, and really leading the best practices and coming up with those templates uh, and, and things that we'll be able to use to better uh, educate ourselves and, and how we're, we're building this movement and this broader initiative. And so as I've mentioned, you can go to goco.ca.gov to learn more about the policy, the platform, and the playbook that's still in draft form and we'll continue to stay in that form until we, we're all comfortable in saying, okay, this is our stamp of, we cannot go to, from alpha to beta. Um, the playbook will incorporate it. It does have the why, right? Like we need to emphasize why we're doing this in the first place. I think we're at an age where government is, is adapting and not just government, as you heard from, from our vendor panelists, this is really where the industry is going to forward as well. And so I think we, we can leverage benefit from the energy that's being developed across the different sectors to really figure out better ways to work together through this initiative and this effort. Uh, we'll have the best practices and tools as I keep referencing. Um, and my call to action to you all is to really go check out what we already have out there and give us your feedback. Uh, we can't do this without you. Um, and we really look forward to having you join this community and this broader initiative that is going to be ongoing, it will evolve, and, and will adapt to, to whatever it is that we'll have to adapt to, right? Um, so with that said, I do want to thank you, and uh, thank you for spending the, this morning with us. Uh, I want to thank the speakers and, and everyone else that's really part of this broader initiative. Uh, I think there's a lot of people that I haven't thanked. I feel like I'm giving, like, I just got an award or something. Um, I want to thank you for spending your morning with us, uh, for being part of this broader initiative, and I look forward to evolving this effort with you all. Thank you. I never introduced myself. Uh, uh, just to wrap up, so I'm Angie, if you have any questions about what we're doing, uh, I am Assistant Secretary at, Digital, at the Government Operations Agency, and again, thanks. <laughs>